I want to welcome you guys tonight. We are on the unceded territory of the Wasatch people. We are so fortunate to be able to use this space and we recognize that we have had a shared history of observing the night sky. Starting last month, at the end of last month, uh, the Friends of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory started our annual appeal, um, our annual space financial exploration. <laughs> and uh, we are a nonprofit charitable organization, and we're able to bring evenings like this to you. But also, we do a number of school tours. Calvin, I believe we were a little bit over 250 last year. Uh, school tours. We, we have many community tours, girl guides, scouts, uh, seniors' homes, etc. So um, donations go a long way to making it possible for us to continue to uh, operate. Um, we, uh, this year, are having a little bit of fun, and we are um, circumnavigating Pluto while we uh, do that fundraising. So every dollar uh, that we raise is worth a kilometer and Pluto has a circumference of 7,232 kilometers. And we are still on our first, our first round of Pluto. And so there is the ability to donate online until December 31st for that, for that appeal. Um, just one piece of housekeeping, uh, when this uh, debate is over, then the, the last dome tour will start. So if you have not had a dome tour yet and you would like one, Calvin uh, will be giving the dome tour and he will he will head out as soon as as soon as we're done here. I'm also going to be giving another planetarium show. And there'll be a planetarium show as well. So yeah, so we'll, we'll keep going. So we are here tonight to have a fun and possibly educational debate about the status or fate of Pluto. So my name is Amy Archer. I am the vice chair of the FDAO, and I'm also gonna be the moderator for tonight's debate. You will be the ones deciding who wins this debate. So you will be uh, voting with your uh, clapping at the, at the end. I will, I will ask for, for who is the winner. So, uh, so you will be uh, having the ability to vote. Let me introduce our two debaters. So, Ruby first. Ruby studies uh, dying and uh, the birthing of stars. She has a passion for astronomy. Her favorite planet is Venus, so she certainly understands a real planet when she sees one. <laughs> Alex uh, studied uh, geography from the same university where Uranus was discovered. So by proximity, he too knows a few things about the planets in the outer solar system. So American astronomer Clyde Tombow discovered Pluto in 1930. From 1930 until 2006, Pluto sat comfortably beyond Neptune. It was our ninth planet. Some of us remember this. Um, in August of 2006, the International Astronomical Union downgraded the status of Pluto to that of a dwarf planet. Nothing about Pluto changed in that moment, but the definition of what made a planet did. Once this change became official, Pluto no longer fit that definition. So the IAU says to be a planet, a planet must be round, it must orbit the sun, and a planet must have cleared the neighborhood of its orbit, which means that the planet, as the tra planet travels, its gravity sweeps and clears the space around it of other objects. <coughs> Some of these objects crash into the planet, others may become moons. And yes, Pluto is, does follow those first two rules. It is round, it does orbit the sun. It is, does not, however, follow the third rule. It has not yet cleared the neighborhood of its orbit in space. And because of this one, one rule, uh, Pluto is no longer considered a planet. So, Alex will start us off. Alex will be arguing that Pluto should be allowed to keep its planet designation. We'll give him five minutes for this argument. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Amy, for 
elected me talk about the planet we all love, Pluto. Now, yeah, thank you, yay. Now, I'm just gonna say right now, if I say Pluto, like the Popeye villain, that's what I called it when I was a little boy. So sometimes I still say that. I mean Pluto, just saying that now. And that's true, um, by the way. Now, a lot of people think of the little Disney dog. That dog was named after the planet. Walt Disney loved that planet so much, he named Mickey Mouse's dog. So that just gives you a strong sense of culturally how important Pluto is. It's true, right? Yeah, thank you. Everyone loves Pluto. Thank you for the groups and the cheers, right? But I'm going to get into the science because the heart, and of course, Pluto has a heart, as we all know, officially known as the Tomberg Regio, but we all call it the heart of Pluto. And you can see it up on this image here. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have my laser on me right now, but you can see there's a heart shape on it. So, you know, it's very long. We didn't even know about that heart shape until 2015. So it was already declassified by the time we knew about it. That's how sad everyone was. You know, it's like, love me, please, right? And that was a New Horizons probe that went by in 2015. Now, as I'm sure we all know, it was viciously declassified in 2006. But it was discovered in 1930. So it was a planet for 76 years, and the thing they call a dwarf planet, for just 15 years. But it takes Pluto 150, sorry, 248 years, Earth years, to go around the sun. So since we discovered Pluto, it hasn't even done one year. So it's gone from not even existing as far as humans are concerned to being a planet to now a dwarf planet um, in less than time. Now, my main argument, and as Amy said, there's three criteria for a planet. It has to be round or technical term, hydrostatic equilibrium. Nice circle. Exactly, there you go. I didn't even look at my notes. Can I just, thank you. Um, hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, and the second one, as you said, is it has to uh, go around the sun. It both does that. Even Ruby here agrees on that point. <laughs> but the third thing that she does not agree on is it clears its orbit, also known as clearing the neighborhood. And that's true. So Pluto has an interesting orbit. It's called elliptical. Now, when we think of all the planets, they're on a thing called the ecliptic. That means they're on a flat plane that goes around the sun. However, Pluto doesn't do that. It goes in a really weird, I don't have any visuals, so you just have to um, imagine. <laughs> but it's a flat plane where all the other planets are, and then Pluto goes sort of above and below that other plane. 20 years of those 248 years, it's inside the orbit of Neptune. Um, so between 1979 and 1999, it was closer to us, technically, it's not really, but kind of, than, and I'll explain that in a book one second, than Neptune, i.e. the orbit of Neptune was further out than the orbit of Pluto. But because of its weird orbit, the closest it actually is to the Sun, and also us, is when it's at the top of its orbit, as it was, technical term perihelion, uh, when it's at the top of its orbit, it will never hit Neptune. But what I don't get is in 248 years, Earth year, so its orbit, only 20 years, it doesn't clear its neighbor. 20 years, that's not even a quarter of its entire orbital time. Yeah, we don't call it a planet. Now, it's very, very small. I will, I will agree to that. You know, it's a small planet, but you know what? So is Mercury. Mercury's twice the size of Pluto, but that's still really tiny. But because Mercury is right near the Sun, we think of it as a planet. If Pluto was the exact same, same orbit, same size, but just between Mars and the asteroid belt, we'd still think of it as a planet. It's just because, oh, it's so far away. It was only discovered in 1930. By the way, how far away it is? Five and a half light hours away. So it sounds far, we're eight minutes light minutes away from the sun. So compared to us, it's much further out, but it's still in the orbital parameters of our sun, and it, um, you know, it's still going. So I, I, don't, I don't get that argument about it doesn't clear its neighborhood. Now, it's also not Pluto's fault it doesn't clear its neighborhood, right? 
It's too small to be able to push things out of the way. Its gravitational mass is too small, but it can't help that. So anyway, I've got more points, but I'm going to let Ruby rebuttal. Oh. 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 What's the device? Sorry. Whatever you're going to do, Dip. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ruhi will now be arguing that Pluto deserves its fate as a dwarf planet. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow, we're already in that good. It's not going to stay. What did you do to me? <laughs> okay, well, thank you to everybody for coming out and listening to this debate. Whether we decide Pluto should be a planet or not by the end, um, it matters, but it's more important that we're all here learning a little bit about our outer solar system, which is, in my opinion, incredibly cool, even if we take Pluto out of the equation. <laughs> so Pluto itself is a special planet where it has made us on planet Earth have to understand that sometimes our science is wrong. Sometimes we need to go back to the books. We need to read them our back. And that takes a lot to understanding that, hey, maybe something that we believe for a very, very long time isn't correct. And sometimes it takes a while for everybody else to believe that as well, but I hope that we can get there maybe a little bit today. So I think it's important to, especially when talking about a planet at the very planet, edge of our solar system, uh, to talk about how our solar system actually formed. So thankfully, I know that. I, Entire research is in protoplanetary disks. So what happens when a star starts to form on its own? So planets and solar systems start when you have large clouds of gas and dust. And that's it, just gas and dust. And it gets pulled in by its own gravitational force. And that is when you start getting something called a protoplanetary disk. So you have your, your baby star in the middle. And then you have a revolving disk of gas and dust all around it. And so then the sun's gravitational force will pull in a lot of rocks, dust, gas. And they start to almost like, if you've ever made a snowball and kind of rolled it down a hill, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger with the more material it collects. Same thing happens when we're starting to build planets. One of the main things that, are, that is different in our solar system is that we have four terrestrial planets, or, or Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then we have our gas giants and ice giants out to the edge of our solar system. And the whole reason that is super important is that once a star in the middle of this protoplanetary disk actually ignites, once it starts fusing hydrogen in its core, it releases something called its solar wind. And so the solar wind is this great force that actually pushes away all of this gas and the dust. So that's why everything before the asteroid belt, everything that is really affected by the solar wind are just rocky planets. That's why none of the planets close to our sun have any sort of real big gaseous thing happening to them. But then we look further out, we have Jupiter, Saturn, we have giants, gas giants, Uranus, Neptune, ice giants. And all of a sudden, we find this itty bitty little rocky thing outside. And we're like, oh, okay. It's really cooled out by, like, far out from the sun. So this might just be a tiny ice planet. And so that's what we went. We thought it was a little ice planet, and that's why it worked with uh, Neptune and Uranus. It made sense. But then Alex talked about how we learned so much about Pluto before it's even done one revolution around our entire solar system is, is a good thing because that means science is working and we're doing our math correctly. So, we actually, Pluto within 20 years of us finding it, actually, when it was demoted, it was in a place in its orbit where we can actually study it. Pluto is so far, we can't even really see it with most telescopes that we have here. It is so tiny and planets don't reflect their own light. So it's completely pitch black up there. It is tiny, hard to see, but finally in its orbit, it is a, in a spot where we actually can study it. And we were able to find out that Pluto has mostly a rocky core. None of the other planets before it have a rocky core. Why? Why is it different than 
and everything else. That doesn't make sense. We shouldn't have one thing that's outstanding. Same thing when we're talking about incarnations of planets. <coughs> so we were talking about how everything sits on an ecliptic. I actually wrote down all the inclinations of our planets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, Mercury being so close to our sun has a really weird orbit. So it has a seven degree inclination. Then Venus 3.4, Earth 0. Uh, Mars 5.1, Jupiter 1.8. Saturn 3.1, Uranus 2.5, Neptune 0.8. I want you to just, in your head, take a guess what the inclination of Pluto is. 45. 45. Oh, jeez. 17.1. It is the highest inclination compared to Mercury, which is at right beside our sun. Something doesn't make sense. So that's why we had to go back to the math. We had to look over everything that we had done before. And the International Astron Astronomical Union finally came up with the fact that you know, Pluto cannot be a planet because where it is just doesn't make sense with everything else. All right? That is my first part. Oops. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, but it's science. And I believe in science. And science is always evolving and changing. And we have to accept the fact, otherwise we stay in the past. And we want to stay in the future, at least for science, I believe. I think it's also fun that the International Astronomical Union made it the three sets of rules of what makes a planet. But then they also went further and created a set of rules of what makes a dwarf planet. So the rules are a little bit different. The first one is the same. It has to revolve around the sun. It has to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. Basically, it needs to be spherical-ish. It needs to be able to hold a circle-like projection. Um, the third one is it doesn't need to clear its entire neighborhood. All right. And then the last one it means it's not a satellite. So it can't be like a moon or something like that. Because the moon, some of the moons around Jupiter and Saturn are incredibly large. They have hydrostatic equilibrium. They could be planets, but they were revolving around something bigger, which means it can't be a planet. So something interesting about Pluto and its moon Charon is that Pluto and Charon are almost exactly the same. They think that Charon was actually just snatched up. And so Pluto and Charon are revolving around each other. Charon's not revolving around Pluto. Pluto and Charon are a binary set revolving around each other because both of their gravitational amount is so like each other that they can't, one is not really going to revolve around the other. They're going to revolve around each other, which is almost like, this doesn't, this is not like for the argument at all, but it's something I really want to share because it's really cool. That Jupiter is so big, it could have been a dying star or a star. It was so big. So Jupiter does go around the sun, but it goes around, if this was the middle of the sun, you would think the this would be where most of the gravity is of the sun, in the middle. But because Jupiter is so big, it actually moves the gravity of the sun outside of the center just ever so slightly. So the sun has a wobble because of how big Jupiter is. This is something fun. I just did a little too much to <laughs> keep it thinking. <laughs> but the main reason I don't think Pluto should be a planet is um, then we're going to be learning things like Charon, which is a dwarf planet in the asteroid belt, will then be classified as a planet. It's round. It has not cleared its entire orbit, nor is it a satellite. We have Eris, which is even further out than Pluto, would be a, a planet. Same sort of issue. It's spherical, has not cleared its environment, would be considered a planet if we didn't have those new sets of rules. <laughs> so even though I really love Pluto and everything it's about, it can't always be included in everything. <laughs> Some, I know. <laughs> Sometimes we need to have definitions. We need to have rules in our world. Otherwise, things kind of get out of hand. All right. compared to a great dame, a dog's a dog. It's small. It's small, but it's still a dog, right? That's what you're saying. It's so small, it's so far away, it doesn't matter. It's just a pixel. True, but these dogs you can fit in your hand, but they're still dogs. They're still wolves, technically. They're, not. they're, little, they're little rats, but they're officially dogs. So there's your point. Uh, I just wrote down dog sizes in my notes. <laughs> but I've got some 
I'm going to wrap this for you. Okay. Now, um, now, you said, you said, yeah, if you agree that there's eight planets, fair enough, Newton about Jupiter, the fair of star, which I agree with you on that too, I think it's almost a star. However, Jupiter's not where it is now, it wasn't always there, it's moved around the solar system. So what we think of as a planet now wasn't always a planet. We had Jupiter in different positions. Probably all the gas giants were in different positions earlier on in the solar system's formation. By the way, that's how we have water on Earth, because the gravitational pull of Jupiter brought comets closer to the inner solar system that crashed on Earth and melted and we have water. FYI. So, just saying that what we think of as a planet now wasn't always the definition. Historically, and we're going back billions of years. But my point is, things can move around the solar system. But Jupiter's considered a planet, okay? Um, all right, you said that we voted to have Pluto not a planet, but only 5% of professional astronomers were at that vote in Prague in 2006. I looked it up, 5%. 5% elected in a government, actually, I probably shouldn't answer that. <laughs> not my point. But you get my point. 5% of astronomers is not enough to have a conclusive debate. Maybe we should have a, another election for that um, at some point, and they should really decide. Um, now, you were saying it's easy. You, you scrubbed off Pluto, and it's easy. <laughs> and that was heartbreaking. Oh. Is there a break in there? And how do we know it's broken? Because there's earthquakes on Pluto. Yes, of course, it has tectonics. Just like we have an Earth, it has volcanoes, cryo-volcanoes. Oh. It, it has... An atmosphere. Do you think I was thinking some science? I think science. The atmosphere, nitrogen, methane, carbon dioxide atmosphere. And get this, the atmosphere is getting thicker every day, every Plutonian day, every Earth day. FYI, another addition to the culture from Pluto, plutonium, the, uh, the element named after the planet. So, yeah, another cultural impact. But yes, it has an atmosphere and it's getting thicker, and I'll tell you for why. Because, oops, because right now, the way Pluto orbits its North Pole is facing directly towards the Sun. That nice heat in Pluto melting the uh, frozen nitrogen ice sheets that cover the, sun, the North Pole, and as it sublimates, it's creating a denser atmosphere. So there is an atmosphere. Is it an atmosphere we can breathe? No. Obviously not, but it's got an atmosphere. Okay, so that's not in and of itself a planetary um, tick in the box, but it's it's something. And we know we we know there's liquid water on Pluto. Yes, a few hundred a few hundred kilometers below the surface, it's frozen on the surface, but underneath there's a thin layer of liquid water. That liquid water contacts rock. Is there life? We don't know. But it's fun to think about, right? It's fun to think about. It's like Europa. If anyone knows about Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, similar characteristics. Now, it didn't listen of itself just to prove it's a planet, but it proves it's, in fact, anything, it's more of a planet than some of the gas giants because they're just balls of gas. Now, for a while, there was a thing called Planet X, and they assumed that there was a big planet out in the Kuiper belt that was affecting the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. And when they were looking for it, they discovered Pluto. They now know there is no planet X. Um, Uranus and Neptune have weird orbits just because they, that's just how they roll. But they discovered, in my opinion, they discovered something even more interesting, a planet that has a rich variety of geological and atmospherological, not the term at all, um, atmospheric uh, conditions. So I think that's really interesting that it has that five moons, one of which is in hydrostatic equilibrium. This moon, I mean, yes, very, very tiny. I call it Charon, by the way, not Sharon. It's funny. I've only seen it written down, so different, uh, <laughs> different uh, pronunciations, same thing. But yeah, five moons, um, some of which they only discovered in the last 10 years. Some of these moons have been discovered since it was declassified. Um, Same thing, you know what I meant to put that. Um, I only mentioned, hang on one second, all oh, right. And Sharon is tidily locked as well. 
our moon is tidally locked are we a planet i mean not in and again and of itself a piece of evidence but it shows that there's a complex system here the plutonian system has many moons and many orbital patterns now i actually think that there should be 10 planets i think they should bring eris in eris and pluto should open planets. that's a debate for another day eris but it's bigger than pluto and it's in the same region of space <laughs> And it has hydrostatic equilibrium. So I think, but that's a debate for another day, by the way. So just saying. But it's an interesting thing. Now, interestingly, Eris killed Pluto's planetary status. Now, you're allowed to boo when I say this name. Mike Brown. If anyone knows who, go and let's give a boo. He's the guy, he's the reason Pluto's not a planet. Do you know what his f found out? Do you know what I found out? This is like, and you see some people getting angry. X, formerly known as whatever. Um, his name on that is the Pluto Killer. Proudly. Proudly. He went to a university, it says here, something called Caltech. I don't know what that is. It doesn't even have a castle. My university had a castle, so I don't know what Caltech is. But anyway, he went to something called Caltech and uh, he discovered Eris. This is how much of a cruel guy he was. He called it Xena. He called it Eris Xena. After a, I never saw that show. Oh, yeah, princess show. Yeah. They changed it to Eris, thank goodness. But this is a kind of person within and with I just wanted to give you a bit of a background. I'm sorry, this guy has a what, PhD in astronomy? Yeah, but for a story called Cow. What do you have? Show me the castle. What I'm saying. Anyway, yes. She's a very smart guy. Anyway. <laughs> but yeah, no. But the last photo that you mentioned New Horizons, and that was a good point, because they launched New Horizons annoyingly the same year that it got declassified. Months before, in fact, January 2006, and it got declassified June 2006, I think, or July. So, months after, they're like, hey, let's send out this probe deep into the solar system to look at some cool stuff. Oh, by the way, what you're going to see is being declassified before you're even at Mars. Um, so, that was a bit disappointing. But when it got there in 2015, it finally gave us pictures because. As uh, Ruby said, our telescopes aren't that good to look at Pluto. It's so small, so far away, it wasn't even discovered until 1930. Even the Hubble Space Telescope is just a speck, just like a dart in a dartboard. It's tiny. Um, but New Horizons, we could get closer and closer and closer. And what do we see? We see the heart. We see these dark areas here. Macla. This one, this is how culturally significant it is, by the way. This one is Cthulhu, and the one you can only see a little bit here is Balrog. That's how important they are culturally. They're named after dark deities because they're a dark era. Oh, so Lord of the Rings! Lord of the Rings! <laughs> More cool than the Senior Warrior Princess, <laughs> right? Also, Pluto's the most colorful object in the solar system. Second most, actually. Only Io beats it. It has red, it has white, it has black. <laughs> Green, blue, and white. Three. This is way more than three. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I can't go there. No, I can't go there. But yeah, and yes, it's far away, but only five and a half light years. That's 39 astronomical units. That's not too far away. FYI, astronomical unit, distance from Sun to Earth. So it's not too, too far away. That's the average, by the way. Obviously, it changes because it has an elliptical orbit. Blah, 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 blah. FYI, the moons are called, thank you, the moons are called Charon, Styx, Nix, Cerberus, and Hydra from the Greek underworld. And uh, yeah, I think they're great, these moons. Um, actually, incidentally, Eris was also officially a planet for one year. Did you know that? So technically, there were ten planets for one year, and I think we should go back to that. That's what, that's really the core of my argument. I think that clearing clearing the orbit is only so so important. I think twenty years in a two hundred and forty years is the core of my argument. Twenty years in a two hundred and forty eight year orbital cycle is a, such a small amount. It's such a small, and it's coming nowhere close to hitting Neptune. Nowhere close. 
So it's not even like it's interacting with these other moon, these other planets. So yeah, I think I've uh, I think I've summed it up as best I can. <laughs> yeah, um, we're ready to hand over for. Oh, that's it. That's okay. it. <laughs> So it's quite small. So oh, half, half the mass is ice, and the ice is mostly made of nitrogen, methane, frozen carbon dioxide. The rock, um, that's a great question. We don't really know because yeah. we've only sent New Horizons, and it was relatively recent, and we haven't done any sort of deeper um, observations. Um, we only assume there's liquid water because there's a thing called convection cells on the surface where you've got the uh, glaciers, and we know that that's forming heat underneath. And that's how we also know it has a molten, probably a molten core. It has internal heat. So I was thinking it might be a mining colony someday. Yeah. Oh, totally. That'd be cool. Yeah. Uh, when you speak of the rules for what counts as a dwarf planet, in that it does have to have hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, how do you reconcile that with Helmia, which is egg shaped? And oh. Is that a dwarf planet? Like Ultima Thule. So it's like, I see, I know what you mean. So those things are called contact binders. So it's like two. Um, what's um, it's shaped like this one of the There's so planets. many. It's, uh, it's, shaped like it's, it's, one, it's one of the other. It's shaped like a potato. It's still shaped called like hydrostatic egg. equilibrium. It's the, just that there's two different forces acting. Yeah. yeah. So it's, hydrostatic it's the next biggest one after, after Pluto. Okay, there is Pluto over there in Haumea. So it's the third biggest so planet. It doesn't, it said spherical. So you need the forces of gravity on opposite sides to cancel each other out, which they do. I see. Okay. All right. That's a question in the second row here. And I'm raising my hand. I've been in school way too long. That's not a good thing. What is that? <laughs> that that is, is the first thing Canada sent to space. Oh. Other wet probe in. No, it's in 59. Was it useful? Oh. Weather. Monitoring weather over Canada. No. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like cloud cover and stuff, I guess. I don't, I'm not an expert. I just know that's what yeah. it is. Which is also yeah. on Pluto. <laughs> so when we do go there, we've got water supply, we've got fuel source, and we've got drink, uh, drinking water. Drinking water, fuel source, and something to breathe because we can split the hydrogen oxygen. David has a question at the back. Why are all the planets in real time that's named after gods? Oh, okay. Okay, this so. This is named after a mouse's god. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. 
11 years British old girl. from no, I Britain did uh, have the honor of leaving <laughs> Pluto. <laughs> yeah. So what I learned from both of you is how human-centric this is. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't oh, think yeah. Pluto gives a damn. It sure does not. <laughs> the universe does the not universe care about us, care about but us. we really care about it. Yeah. <laughs> Astronomical, astronomical Union are human centric, so I'm battling them fundamentally, <laughs> not Pluto <laughs> and awesome. the universe. That's a big battle. <laughs> 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 I know people who were involved in that vote. We have some, we, yeah. we definitely have some friends that were involved in that vote. Yeah. Who knows how they voted? But yeah. I mean, you know the results. They're not, right? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, how did you guys decide which one of you is going to be on which side? Bro, it, it was just given to us. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like my side. Can I, can I, this might change. Uh, but when I first took on this debate, I thought Ruth was not a planet. This is 100% honest. I was the same as Ruby. I actually changed my opinion researching for this oh, debate. Oh. And I'm not even joking. Yeah. Can I tell you that's also how conspiracy theories work? <laughs> oh, my God. <goodness>. Yes. <laughs> discovered since classical times. So all the other planets were discovered in ancient Greece. And you know, and then as we know, the Romans Romanized Grecian things. So that's how all the other planets got their names. And then when they discovered Uranus, they called it um, King George Planet because William Herschel wanted money from the King of England. So he's like, hey, I'll name the new planet. This is true. I'll name the new planet after him, get some cash. And uh, and then all the other countries in the world, like France mostly, were like that. <laughs> no, we can't have the English king at that planet. And so they decided, but Calvin actually had an interest, this, this is Calvin over there. What's the fact you told me the other day about Uranus compared to the names of all the other planets? Oh, right, okay. And and uh, this is what we talk about when I think planet. I was looking this up, and it's like, it, that Uranus isn't a Roman god. No, it's the only planet that's a Greek god. We yeah. know. All the other planets are Roman gods. It's weird. Right? It's so weird. It's weird. <laughs> and the name of the Roman version of Europe? So I, I think it's Calus or Celus or something. There you go. Just name it. Just name Roman. it. It's like Roman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that answers your question. <laughs> are they are they the same in other languages? I wonder. Ooh, I'm going to say. That's a good question. I don't think so. <laughs> certainly, yeah. Certainly not languages that had a rich culture of astronomy and were not connected to you know, the Western world, mm -hmm. I would also almost guarantee they have their own constellations, their own names and constellations and other things in space, so I would assume not. Mm -hmm. We're in a Western Romanized centric world, so that's why we call it. Why we call it. All right. That's it. So, <laughs> well, thank you all for coming.